Hello, and welcome once again to the PowerScore LSAT podcast. Big episode here in terms of length and uh, a bit of a, an important one. This is episode 50. This is John Denning in Los Angeles. And this is Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. John, yes. did you think that when we reached episode 50, we'd be talking about a three-section LSAT? <laughs> I didn't think we'd ever reach episode 50. That's a good point, too. But if somebody no, had sent me to the no, great LSAT course, casino no. and said, you have all this money, and one of the options was three-section LSAT in 2020, I would have been like, oh, I'm betting against that big time. Yeah, you and I have both lost our, lost our shirts on this one, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jim, man, are. what are you drinking today? You know, we're doing this in the morning, so I am not drinking yet, although I fear this conversation may drive me to a bottle. I've got a, a sugar-free Red Bull Sands vodka. What about you? Coffee for me. No additives. <laughs> Sands no creamer, Jameson. I suppose. Sands Baileys. Yeah, none of the usual additives. It's not an Irish coffee, which is what I'd really prefer here. Yeah, maybe after the episode, you and I can both spice things up. Indeed. Well, anyway, we decided to title this episode LSAT Flex and the End of the World. That's right. It's not quite that bad, but we just like the title, and certainly there's been uh, some doom and gloom online about this, and so we wanted to kind of play around with that. And the song choice, I know one of the favorites, one of our favorite bands, both of us, uh, take it away with that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's an old song by The Doors. I guess every song by The Doors is an old song these days. But... <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah. That's a bit redundant. Uh, a Doors song called The End. Um, a great tune. Obviously, Jim Morrison was a sort of tragic hero in many ways. The Curse of 27, Morrison. James Douglas Morrison. And the song is about 11 minutes long. Yeah. And don't let that put you off. This is an epic and it is a classic. Um, I loved reading the accounts of The Doors playing this at the Whiskey A Go Go mm -hmm. on Sunset Strip and when they were the house band. And uh, just fascinating how the the drink servers would stop to watch the performance, which doesn't happen all the time. So just a, a, a classic, but the end, and of course the lyric in there, this is the oh, end. Of course. <laughs> yeah, and if we're framing this a little bit tongue-in-cheek uh, with the title, with the song, with all of it. Because as we will discuss, the, uh, the doom and gloom aspect nature of this, I think that a lot of people have assigned it, is incorrect in my opinion. I think that this is actually quite a ray of sunshine in these somewhat gloomy times. Yeah, but we'll also talk about the controversy over mm -hmm. this because it is significant. And uh, the naysayers, I understand their viewpoint. And sure. I, I think it's very much worth addressing. So we're going to get into a lot of things here about this uh, new option that they've offered uh, and, and talk about the fairness of it, some of the strengths and weaknesses of it, and uh, how it'll be used, how to prepare for it. Just a, a, a real... I don't really like this word, but I'm going to use it anyway. A smorgasbord. A smorgasbord. <laughs> Cornucopia. Uh, I don't like that word. Yeah. Uh, Before we do, say. though, let's get a, a very quick little bit of housekeeping done here. Uh, there's two things in the LSAT world I think we should at least mention. One yeah. is very personal to us because we are hosting a seminar tomorrow night, a webinar tomorrow night on reading comprehension. That is exactly the case. Reading comprehension skills test. Mm -hmm. That is at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, on Thursday, 5 p.m. Pacific, John and I are actually uh, running the show with that. So it'll be perhaps less banter than uh, we get here. We'll focus really in on the LSAT. I won't be drinking <laughs> <laughs> since it'll be live. If I mess up, uh, I can't be fixed. I so. make no promises. <laughs> uh, come on, join me. Fair enough. Um, join us, though. That'll be, I think it's going to be a good one. Yeah, looking forward to that. And then for those of you who might have had the chance, LSAC just did a seminar, a webinar on COVID-19, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But one of the things they did announce during their webinar was that they're going to do another one next week. And this is actually going to be crucial for one of the things that we talk about here, which is the uncertainty over the weighting of each section of the new test. Yeah. So just something to be aware of that that's coming up in a week. And I'm hopeful 
not optimistic, but I am hopeful that that provides some of the information that so many people are already desperately craving. Yeah. And I'm one of them. Yeah, same. Uh, it's the question I've probably gotten the most from people in the last 24 yeah. hours. So we, we'll we do our best to fill you in on what we can today. We may have an update on this information. We will have an update, hopefully, in a week. Yeah. We'll talk about that as we get into it. Cool. But the big news is that uh, yesterday... I got a call from LSAC and they were like, hey, you got a few minutes to talk. Uh, and I was like, of course, you know, they call me. I'm going to I'm going to take their call. And it was a really pleasant conversation. I, t I spoke to Kelly Testy for a few minutes. She's always, I think, quite friendly and quite affable. But she dropped two LSAT bombs. The first one was one that I've been expecting for quite a while mm -hmm. and to some extent pressuring them over, which is, could you please cancel April? And they did that. So that got out of the way. But in the process of that conversation, she added the second half, which is, hey, by the way, we're going to have a remote LSAT option for test takers in May. Mm -hmm. and I was, my first reaction was, this is fantastic. And she said, it's called LSAT Flex. All right. And I'm not going to make a I whole mean, bunch of jokes yeah, about the flex part. <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Let's flex it out. Uh, called LSAT Flex. Uh, and then just very casually, it'll be three sections. And I'm sure that'll create a lot of excitement online. It was close to what she said to me. And I was like, as my jaw dropped, I was like, excitement, yes. Yeah. Uh, consternation, fear, uh, anger uh, over some of the candidates who can't get in on it. <laughs> so that's what we're here to talk about. We're going to yeah. talk about LSAT Flex, everything we know about it, uh, and how this affects the entire process, both the LSAT and law school admissions going yeah. forward. For anyone out there wondering about Dave's immediate reaction as expressed to me, I won't repeat it here, but no. <laughs> I did it's post a Reddit. definitely not safe for work. The text that I sent you was that two right. words. Yeah. And uh, the first one was holy. Exactly. So. Yeah. You can maybe guess the second. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I did post a Reddit thread about some of this yesterday. If anyone wants the quote, you can scroll the comments. And you'll see what Dave said. You can said. find it. Yeah, you can find it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wholly accurate, by the way, uh, despite <laughs> that's not what you said. So, no. yeah, let's get into the details of this, man, because this is uh, just mind-blowing fascination at this point. They've canceled right, April. Look. They've added an at-home testing option in May faster than I think either of us would have ever suspected they could do. We were talking maybe July, uh, optimistically, for them to get at-home testing done. I thought June was 50-50. Maybe June, yeah. I thought they'd push it back um, and then go ahead and get the remote option maybe late June. So just on this note alone, one of the things I said was uh, it's impressive. Very. And... Some people were like, oh, they don't have all the details and all this. I, I don't know that I expected all the details to come out immediately, but I will say that I know they worked hard on this, and I am impressed by the speed of it. This is more than what almost everybody expected from them. So congratulations on that yeah, part. Yeah, full, full credit. I mean, assuming it gets pulled off correctly, but at this point, at least in principle, this was quite an achievement. As Kelly said, and I know this caught your uh, ear today too, she said in the webinar, never waste a crisis. <laughs> yeah. Which it's a is- Funny comment. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think she meant that any kind of like capitalistically. I think she meant no. this is an opportunity to do the right thing. Or as she said, in a crisis, the key is just always do the next right thing. This was the right thing. I'm really hopeful they can pull it off. They needed to do this. Obviously, the technical aspects of this will be discussed shortly, mm -hmm. uh, and that's where my real concern is, mm -hmm. to be honest. But I'm glad that they've done it. Uh, I'm I'm pleased that an option exists for people in March and April who got canceled on. And so, as an overall whole, I feel good about it. Yeah, uh, like some I said, of the in, in principle, I think this is wonderful. Yeah, in execution, we shall uh, see. I'm less certain about it. We shall so, see. As a principal, yay. As uh, the actual specific test is pulled off, mm, less less confident. But but yeah, as of now on paper, that's the plan in, in May. We'll talk about when in May. Let's talk first, though, about who. Who gets this at-home test in May that's been added to the schedule? There was not an LSAT in May originally scheduled. Exactly. And it was one of the things that I actually suggested was like try to add an LSAT in May. And then as time passed, I started to think they can't do it. Yeah. 
I doubt it. And yet they came back and did it. So I, of course, will take full credit for this <laughs> new test that's been uh, Yeah, for anybody happy out. about this, you have Dave to thank. For anybody <laughs> else happy, you have Dave to thank. You at LSAC. <laughs> But who can take it? It is not an open registration test. So if you're just listening to this and you're thinking, I think I might go ahead and take this test, uh, it's unlikely that you will qualify. The qualifications to get in are anyone who is registered for the April 2020 LSAT as of April 7th is eligible. This includes March registrants who were moved to the April test when March was canceled. Yeah. So they have said to me in our conversations, our focus is on these April students who were thinking they were taking the April test and who are not going to be able to. When it comes down to people who moved earlier, because a number of students said, look, this COVID situation is bad news. There's no way I'm going to be able to take April, or even if I can, it would be difficult to do so in good circumstance or conditions. Uh, and they jumped out to June, they have been told to call LSAC, who apparently is going to take their requests and put them under consideration. However, I really hope that those students get the opportunity to take this test, and I believe that they will. I'm reasonably confident, too, that they will allow people who maybe jump from April to, say, June or July, but they're going to let those people slip back into this May test. Exactly. I think that'll be the case. It will be almost... Criminal now, too. Um, and to as a reminder, I should say, for those who were registered for March, when that test got canceled, they were automatically pushed to April. So they're going to qualify. You mentioned this, but they're going to qualify for this test as well. So if you're thinking, well, I was signed up for March, you're going to be a May eligible candidate. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the next question that will obviously come up is, well, when the heck is this new May <laughs> test? Yeah. And this is actually, or was, the first sign to me that they were attempting to move extremely quickly because what they said was it will be available in the second half of May, <laughs> which is a really long period of time in my opinion. Well, I think, <laughs> yeah, it's 15 days, I think. or How long is May? 31? Rough. Yeah. Yeah. 15 and a half days. That's a lot. That's a lot that's of a, days. That's a big window to have. Yeah, that's quite a window. And I am you know, I'm fine with that. It was just interesting that there wasn't a specific time frame. And as it, you know, one of my first questions was, how are you going to do this? Are you going to administer it all on the same day and have everybody show up at, you know, 1 p.m. Eastern time? Because I couldn't see how they could do that technically. The resources needed to proctor this test, as we will talk about, uh, would be overwhelmed. And so what they have said is that it looks like it'll be over several days. Maybe two, maybe three, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there will be different available testing times. So you can go in and actually choose a time that works the best for you. I love that. If it's available. Yeah, yeah. I love that, by the way, that you could potentially choose like, well, I'm a morning person or I'm an afternoon person or I I need a Monday or I've got Tuesday off. I think everyone pretty much has Tuesday off these days, but. (laughs) 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 Yeah. No comment about that. (laughs) You and I don't, clearly. But definitely, yeah. But the ability to to pick a time that's best for you, you know, we talked about this in response to a mailbag question previously, where a student had said, like, I score so much better when I test early in the morning versus in the afternoon, but I'm registered for the June test or whatever it was, which is given at twelve thirty local. It's too late for me. What do I do? And of course, I'm the exact opposite. The later, the better. This may give people an opportunity to really structure things to their own preferences, their own skill sets, or. I don't know, circadian ability. It makes a difference if you're a morning person and night person. It will also make a difference uh, how many time slots are available. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they will try to run out a 24-hour clock on this. Um, I don't know. But they said that they will be sending out instructions and finalized dates and information on or before April 17th. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at another 8 to 10 days on that. But at least you have an idea of when this test is and also the fact that they're going to try to, like, rotate people in and out of doing it. Don't know what their capacity is. Maybe that's part of the delay here is they work not only with schedules but with Proctor U, who is going to be doing the proctoring uh, for the exam. Yeah. I've got to think, as we mentioned at the outset of this, that if they're doing a webinar on this specifically next week, that'd be a really good time for them to, to confirm some of these details. I think literally this time next week, we'll know a lot of these things. I hope. I hope that's part of the presentation. 
They need to. If they were looking at the comments in today's webinar that they did, <laughs> uh, and I believe that they were because they were studiously ignoring one or two of the comments, they realized that they have to get the details out quickly. Yeah. And she, Kelly did say, she's like, look, we're moving so quickly on this. We don't have everything locked down. And I know that's been frustrating to some people, but there's also at least the benefit of knowing that something's coming. And they took the greater good to get that message out and try to, you know, realize, look, some of this stuff isn't going to be locked down. I know that made some people very angry last night mm -hmm. when they first heard the news. Sometimes this is what happens. These are unusual and extraordinary times and everything doesn't work perfectly. So... Yeah, celebrate the broad strokes in this case. At least we know there's a test in May coming. At least we know that there's options in place. And we'll talk about what that means for June and July as well. We certainly will. Now, the real kind of like amazing information inside of all this was that, oh, hey, it's an LSAT at home. Sounds cool. Except they have changed it. And it's not really the LSAT. And here's where the flex comes in. Because they just dropped out two sections. <laughs> Typical LSAT is two logical reasoning sections, one logic games, one reading comprehension, and an experimental. Right. What has been dropped now is the experimental is gone. Mm -hmm. So you know this is unlikely to be a long-term solution just based on that. And then they are dropping one of the logical reasoning sections. So this is a three-section test, mm -hmm. one of each type. The length of the test will remain the same at 35 minutes. Per section, yeah. And, so if this is an hour yeah. and 45-minute LSAT, basically. <laughs> Thanks. You, no, it's three sections, total of 35 <laughs> 35 minutes. 35 minutes. Good luck. You're all good dead. luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 35, sec, uh, 35 <laughs> minutes per section, three sections, no break. And the first question that comes up is, why would you do this? Why would you change the fundamental nature of what's being scored? Because you just lost roughly 25 questions of scored LR. And online and in my conversation with them, they said it's about demand. Uh, and I think what they mean when they say it's about anticipated demand is a five-section test or a four-section test takes so long that they were concerned about fitting everybody in. Yeah over the course of you know the, the several days that they plan to implement this test. And then the second thing was the needs of the remote testing solution, which I thought was funny uh, because obviously that relates to the fact that you've got proctors watching this and also the break situation. If you have a four or five section test, you're going to have to give people breaks to use the bathroom, to grab a drink of water, what have you, and that's a security risk. Mm -hmm. So what they decided was, we need one sitting for this exam. It's got to be beginning to end, no breaks. And I think in a the decision they made here from a physical human standpoint makes sense. Because mm -hmm. after you've you've gone up to uh, an hour and 45 minutes, you're going to start to get a little bit antsy. You may need to use the restroom. So without commenting on the fairness or validity aspects, the three sections, I think, was done for largely physical needs of both scheduling and, you know, the human body. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, there's always a break after the third section of the current test. And I don't think at home they can have you leave the room and maintain validity or security. So here we are. Yeah. You're asking for trouble. Now, the interesting thing is, is you've just changed the fundamental nature of what is being presented. How does the scoring scale change? And the answer is, it doesn't. It does not. It is still 120 to 180. Now, this is key for applicants, because what this is saying is that you're going to get a score that is the same as everybody else who is applied, whether it was last fall or last year or what have you. So you're going to get the same type of LSAT score. Yeah, which on the one hand is obviously great. It means you can compete head-to-head -head with people who took the quote-unquote normal test. Uh, Schools won't see you differently. Schools won't have to try to figure out how your, you know, 85 score or whatever it would be compares to someone else's 158. You're going to be able yeah. to, to essentially exist on the exact same playing field. At the same time, it does raise some questions because your raw score obviously will be different. The number of questions you get correct is inherently affected by the fact that there are now a lot fewer questions on the test itself. That's exactly right. And I think this is a big point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've debated exactly what to do with this. Let's come back to this point okay. about the score conversion. Um, it's probably the number one question that is out there. 
no one has an exact answer yet, yeah. but I really do want to dive into this. It certainly was Let's the top question off. in that webinar today. Watching the chat comments became almost comical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was one dude Hundreds in there who just clearly them. was copy pasting and he must have posted the same thing, oh, I don't know, 150 times. Yeah, he was getting angry, he I'd was. say. <laughs> These things happen. So we'll come back to the score conversion aspect of how you take a three-section test and convert it into a four-section test scale that's been being used for years and years and years. So let's talk about how they're actually going to do it. Yeah. So it's going to be at home. It's going to be on a computer. It's not going to be on your phone and it's not going to be on a tablet. But insofar as what you could use, you are at a laptop or a desktop computer with either a Windows or Macintosh operating system. Yeah. So it will at least allow for all kinds of varied OS and a different degree of hardware. Here's what I find weird, though. This is a test that a lot of people have been preparing for on tablets. It's been given on tablets for almost a year now. Yeah. And then they move it, again, remote, as this were, and you can't use a tablet anymore. I think for that's a lot so of people, that's going to instantly cause some consternation. Feels ironic. <laughs> that's, a, that's a way to put it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the circumstance is a result opposite of that intended. Yes. To, qu oh, to quote Reality Bites, the movie. Well done. I didn't know the <laughs> quote, but well said. It's actually really cool. Winona Ryder goes for a, uh, a job interview at a newspaper and, you know, she's going on and on and it's not going well. And um, the, at the end, the person kind of challenges, like, how to define that? And she's just like, uh, uh, uh. And then the elevator doors close, and it's clearly she'd not get the job. <laughs> and then she later on asks, uh, I think it's Ethan Hawke, and he immediately puts out that definition, which, of course, has stuck with me forever. <laughs> <laughs> I know so, that's not a Kevin Smith movie, but who, who did that movie? Could not. I couldn't answer that. I know Ben Stiller's in it. Yeah. Uh, Janine Garofalo's in it, but yeah, I couldn't tell you. You're going to have to look that one up. You're going to have to look it up. Man, 80s Winona. She was everything. Mm hmm. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, with Proctor U here, you're going to have to have the laptop or a computer. Mm -hmm. No tablet is used. And that is because the, the company doing it, Proctor U, does not work well with that. You'd have to point your camera away from you up towards the ceiling or something like that. And so there are problems with that. The, the key thing here, though, is that they have a system in place to kind of forestall cheating to make sure that everything is actually working the way they want it to work. So you're going to have to conform to their system. And just as an aside, especially for those who are concerned about like inequity over whether or not some people have computers and so forth, LSAC has said that if you don't have the technical requirements, they will try to work with you mm -hmm. to either loan it to you, provide it to you, put you in touch with somebody who can make it available to you. So if you're in that situation, I urge you to contact them immediately and begin discussing this so that you don't get left out just because you only have a tablet sure. and not a desktop or yeah, whatever you yeah. actually need. Once again, to their credit, I think they're uh, they're trying to be as flexible and as fair-minded in all of this as possible from what I've seen so far. So yeah, don't hesitate if you feel like maybe you're being disadvantaged. I think they'll, they'll come up with something. Yeah, Proctor U is, is really interesting, and you probably know a bit about it. The GRE uses this current system when they've moved to at-home testing. Uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, it's live proctoring. So as I understand it, somebody literally is on the other end of a webcam watching you take the test. At least for part of the test, mm -hmm. and you don't know when they are watching and when they are not. As they say, you're monitored by live remote proctors via the camera and microphone. Mm -hmm. So they're listening in the <laughs> test takers' computers. Yeah. The video and audio feed will be recorded and further reviewed by human reviewers and AI. Which is another way of saying, if some kind of noise event occurs during your test, it'll be flagged in their system, and then they'll have a human go look at it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a prior podcast, I was like, if Albert, your cat, all of a sudden starts, you know, coughing up a hairball, and you're like, Albert, stop it, it'll flag that. And at least as far as LSAT writing, yeah. when that scenario happened, the writing test was canceled. And so this is, I think, one of our big concerns from a technical standpoint is that ProctorU is already being used for LSAT writing. LSAT writing has been, mm. uh, I'll describe it charitably as bumpy. 
<laughs> I thought you were going to describe it charitably as terrible. And that also <laughs> would have <laughs> would have been fairly charitable. Uh, so well done, you. Yes, I, it's been it's had some technical problems, and there's been students that I have spoken to have tr- have had to take it two to three times yeah. before they can get something in. And there's been some weird technical glitches, uh, a lot of difficulty, and so I know exactly how I'm going to feel when these tests actually start happening in May, and it's going to be fingers crossed. I'm going to hope for yeah. the best for everybody, but I am going to be fearing that there's going to be some very bad things that happen. The difference here, I think, is if there is some sort of anomaly, some cancellation event, cancellation-worthy event, they're not just going to let you come back a week later and take the LSAT again. I think that's probably going to be a wrap on May. Well, one of the things that came up is the actual technical requirements. People have said, I have an old computer, I have unreliable Wi-Fi. Uh, what happens? And they have said yeah. that they have a system in place that would allow them to freeze the test and allow you to return to it without, you know, undue delay or problems. So they have clearly thought about it. The difference here is this. If you do a 30-minute writing sample and there's a problem, okay, look, it sucks, but it's not the end of the world if it doesn't get recorded. If you go take a three-section LSAT and towards the end there's a problem, the, the response on this, the agitation, mm-hmm. will quite justifiably be much, much higher than with a unscored writing sample. Right, right, right. Where they could just give you a different prompt and have you do it the next day. Yeah. So, yeah, I would, um, if I'm going to encourage anything here, I would encourage people to be extremely particular and diligent about how they follow the rules of what the proctoring software demands. Do not, do not put yourself in a situation where something could interfere with your test. Which in this time, and you know, currently what we're dealing with can be a real issue. If you live in a house with a couple of roommates, you're basically going to have to beg them, please, for the next two hours, shut up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Put your cat no outside. loud music. Yeah. yeah, don't go crazy. Don't be yelling. Show some respect because not only could that be a d- huge distraction, it could conceivably cause a flagging event during your test if it's if it's too loud or somebody busts in like, bro. You know, come drink beers with us. It's like, I'm trying to take the LSAT, man. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're like, no, I'm not taking the LSAT anymore. <laughs> oh, Your roommate sound cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's my wife. Okay. That's <laughs> she, right. she busts in. Your roommate bro. is cool. I know her. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we're gonna we're gonna continue to encourage people to be extremely particular uh, about how they set up their own testing environment here because again, you don't even at best case, if it got flagged and canceled, you're probably going to lose the money. You're going to lose a month or more. So, yeah, this would be a, a real a high-cost situation for some silly thing to, to interfere. Yeah. We know there will be some problems. Mm-hmm. The question is, is how they get dealt with and what happens. Yes. And some of that we um, don't know yet. I'm hoping we learn in a week. That's exactly right. So, the cost on this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it's a shorter LSAT, so it should be cheaper, right? No. False. This is the same cost as a regular LSAT. And I am sure that the argument, the counter to my claim that it should be cheaper <laughs> is, yeah, well, we just had to spend millions on these, this proctor si- situation. Yeah. So that's your offset. But you don't have to send tablets. You don't have to pay for in-person proctors. You don't have to rent facilities at a hotel or on a campus. Shouldn't it be cheaper? I think if this test had been, say, 100 bucks the outrage over it not being widely available would have been much, much higher because it would have been like cheaper and shorter. You know, what are you going to do next? Just give everybody 180? (laughs) Like how easy is this going to be for people? Yeah, I should note that the outrage you're referring to are the people who can't take the May test. Um, Oh, they're mad. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, And I sympathize with their anger. They're like, sweet. Yeah. You know, especially if you're a person who are like, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not going to worry about it. And then you discover, well, it's. I could have done this, and I just didn't sign up for it because I felt like the social situation was becoming right. problematic. Yeah, you're justifiably mad, and I feel your anger and acknowledge it. Yeah. It's and we'll, reasonable. We'll cycle back to that fairness issue here in just a bit. Before we do, though, I think there's one final logistical piece to touch on, which is the release. How are they going to handle the scoring uh, in terms of turnaround? We'll talk about the scoring itself maybe later, but... This is where you can see what the intent of this exam is. The intent of this exam is to get candidates who are 
in the process of applying the ability to actually complete an application. Because instead of the usual 21 day or so turnaround, mm -hmm. now it's 14 days. Yeah. So they're saying you will get your score in two weeks. And I know for you and I, this is no big deal because we've been aware for years that they can score an LSAT in just a couple of days. Right. I mean, they can score it instantly once they get it. But to return scores to students has always been something where it's like, we have to do all these, you know, integrity and validity checks. Mm -hmm. They've always had the ability to do it faster. We've seen this before with rescheduled exams and yeah. so forth. What's interesting to me as part of this, all of this is interesting to me, frankly, but what's interesting in the two-week turnaround versus three, the two-thirds um, timeline, is that of all of the tests they've ever administered that would require security checks, this has got to be the most like heavily investigated one, right? Yeah. This is one that seems to be like on a case by case, person to person basis. You really want to check and make sure nothing hinky has occurred. And yet they're turning <laughs> this around faster. It's a good word. It's an interesting word. Thank you. <laughs> it always makes me think of Harry Potter, yeah. the hinky punks. Hinky. So, anyway. But the, yeah, uh, to turn this around in two weeks when they're having people do it basically on their own solo, that to me was very surprising. They're relying heavily on the AI security here yeah. to flag anything that is an undue movement on the camera or an unexplainable sound on the uh, the recording. So that's how they're getting past this. They're like, all right, now it looks like we're going to be able to run through this. Yeah. I read reports about ProctorU on the GRE even tracking your eye, like to see if it was looking at the screen or looking off camera, off screen, to see if you were reading something somewhere else or someone was communicating you, with you. So this is. And I'm sure that's where the AI comes in, where they track, like, focus. It's fascinating how much they're able to uh, to determine anomalies or outlier events, like whatever. Don't be watching my eyes. I know. It's creepy, right? I'm against it. <sighs> anyway, so two weeks after, that will allow your scores to get into law school hands uh, a little bit quicker than normal from a typical LSAT. Obviously, speeding your ability to complete your application uh, and for law schools to make an, a decision on what to do for admission, denial, et cetera. Yeah. Now, we know March and April were uh, non-disclosed tests. That's always been the case. June is disclosed. What about this one? Uh, non-disclosed as far as I understand it. Yeah, me too. Which means you're not going to see the questions. You're not going to see the score conversion scale, whatever it may turn out to be. You will get your score, you know, the 120 to 180. So insofar as that, this is going to be another black box exam. Yeah. This is the norm. Uh, more tests than not are non-disclosed. And so especially this one, this is the one I'd really like to see. Me too. Like, what? <laughs> Mostly for the conversion. I want to see how they do the scaling. Yeah. And the, the content here, one of the things they've made it quite clear is that the questions that are being used are what they call normal or genuine LSAT questions, meaning they're being pulled from the same pool that they would take for any LSAT that they were making. This is what the experimental section is for. Mm -hmm. Everybody listening to this hopefully knows that and how it works at this point. If not, we've got tons of articles about it. We've talked about it many times. This is the, the pretest section that they use so that in the future, they can give new questions to students but have an idea of how well you've already done. And that will play a role in terms of like the fairness aspect that we talk about in just a moment. Yeah. But you're not going to see those questions apparently afterwards. And one of the questions that immediately came up was, do you think that they're going to use just one test? And that's, I thought, a fascinating question to me. Yeah, me too. Because I fear that the, the likelihood is they won't. Because if something gets out early about, oh, I had this game and it was like this and somebody regrettably were to post like a setup or something like that online, that would cause integrity issues. And given that they're very concerned about test security, and rightly so, I would suspect that there will probably be multiple forms of this exam. Certainly, it's not going to be everybody starts with one section, then has the same second section, the same third. They're going to rotate those things around. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if we found out later on, yeah, there was a couple different tests that they used. Yeah, if they spread this over two or three days, you'd think they'd have to mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, at the same time, we know they do this with accommodated tests all the time, where even a week later they'll give the same test for accommodated people that they gave for non-accommodated people on the official date. So, one wonders. 
Yeah. And that, that crossed my mind too. So either way that it actually goes, we don't know. And they're not going to tell us. No, no, they're not no. going to say, oh, there's going to be three forms or there's going to be one form. They don't want that information out. They never disclose that prior to the exam. We usually just figure out afterwards what happened. The other question that I got a lot, and I'm sure you did too, um, was... I think, think I already they're going to let us yeah, go ahead. preview the score, cancel, <laughs> and then cancel it if we don't like it, just like they did last July. Uh, you know, no. yeah. <laughs> you give them an inch, they want a mile. No. No, they will not do that. Um, There's been zero indication of this. I and, and I think the conversation that you and I had yesterday with one of our instructors was... Uh, actually, there's a disincentive mm -hmm. for them to do that. The whole point of this is to get applicants on record with a score so they can apply. They know that if they give the option of canceling, they're going to lose a number of people who might have otherwise kept their score. So I can't see why they would want to do this. Um, that's the idea. There's no incentive for it. There's actually an incentive not to do it. Yeah, they did this last July as a one-off because they wanted people to come take that digital test despite the fact that it was a 50-50 unknown chance of what you would get going into it. Again, if anyone's not familiar with the history of last July, look it up. But <laughs> we don't need to go. I was, yeah, we've, was we've worried covered. you were going to cover the nope. history. And I was like, please don't. Nope. Uh, <laughs> we've done that. But this is, these are people who are already registered, already trying to take the test, should be super grateful for the fact that they can take a test earlier than it looked like they'd be able to. Uh, and again, as we've covered, in a way, a place and a way that is incredibly beneficial. Yeah, it's, and it's very similar to the test they expected to take. That's one of the reasons. That transitional LSAT, it was not just the uncertainty. It was that it was a whole new testing environment yeah. or format for people. That doesn't exist here because, sure, a tablet in a, you know, at a college testing room is one thing, but it's not all that dissimilar from using a laptop yeah. or a desktop. In your and kitchen. so, yeah, the, the, the differences here are not um, enough, I would suspect, to warrant the idea of you get to see your score and preview it and then decide whether to keep or cancel it. Yeah. Of All course, right. that would be cool if they let you, but no. Maybe one day. Right. We know that other tests do this that are major level graduate school tests. GMAT, for instance, yeah. yeah. I would love to see them do this. I, I think that whole thing, like, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste is about <laughs> learning. And I think that's what's happening here. This may have accelerated some decisions that we might not see again this year or next year, but we may very well see come back in a couple of years. It's clear that they're exploring and researching how to deliver these results. They're trying to adapt to uh, a changing world, certainly from a technological standpoint. This could actually give them a window uh, that allows them to think, we can do this, yeah. we can change this, we can make it shorter. We could permanently give it at home, which I would love to see. Yeah. In continuing to do that, though, obviously, the, the question that in my mind gets raised and has been raised constantly since that's what's announced is, is this really fair, though? And fair is a word that I, I tend to kind of cringe at because it's just such a childish concept. But <laughs> the idea of, look, you're allowing people to take a shorter test at home. And you're only giving certain people access to it simply because they were inconvenienced in March and April. Is that fair to the people who took the test in January or February or who have to take the test maybe in August or whatever the case may be, or last year? Who would take a five-section test? Who took five, who had to go somewhere, sit in a room full of strangers, etc. Is that fair? In my opinion, no. Of course not. Yeah. It's an automatic difference. And for many people, they'd want to take it at home. Not everybody, though, certainly. But it's from a physical and mental standpoint, you've just changed the dimensions of what you were looking at. A five-section test with a break in it, having to go to another location, no phone even, <laughs> uh, to you know get an Uber there or back. It's very taxing. It's very stressful physically. Uh, it's you're being put upon. This completely eliminates a lot of those aspects, shortens it, drops 50 questions. Yeah. You know, the questions in the experimental and then the questions in the score to LR are gone. And that also eliminates an hour and 10 minutes of testing time. So when I, when I was looking at this yesterday and people were asking me about it, the first thing that I said was, this is the triple bonus. Yeah. You're taking it at home, you have a reduced question count and reduced amount of testing time. 
just from a mental and physical standpoint, this is undeniably going to be easier. Yeah. And, you know, I think everybody can look at that and be like, okay, that's, those are fair points. Yeah. I'll add to that too, that you may be able to even pick what time, what day you take it. Another bonus. My dream has always been to take the LSAT in the afternoon, not wearing pants. And this could... <laughs> I don't, you don't know if I needed to know All that, right. man. TMI. <laughs> well, there you go. So that could potentially allow for this. Sorry, Proctor, you you had to see that. But <laughs> there's some guy out there who's going to be taking it with no shirt on for sure. Uh, uh, I am that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if fairness means perfect equivalence or perfect equality or whatever across the board, then no, immediately on many levels, this is not fair. It is not an identical experience. Exactly. However, does that mean that these test takers have an advantage inherently? Well, they have those advantages, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have an overall final advantage because this is different. But to me, the results of the fairness question come down to what happens to scores. Mm -hmm. Would your score remain the same on this format or the other format? And would scores as a whole remain the same? And this is interesting because I, I don't know the answer to this. This is inside the work that they've done. And when I was talking to Kelly, she was very clear about the idea that they had looked at this psychometrically first, all right? So the psychometricians mm -hmm. are the people who actually put the test together and make sure that it is valid and fair and has test integrity. And she was very clear that they looked at it and they had... Uh, done studies and come to the conclusion that they could produce this LSAT and have it be equivalent in terms of results. So that's what they are saying uh, as to whether or not that's wholly true. I don't know. We won't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll never know in a way. Well, I think we have to take people at their word. I suppose the closest we could get would be from secondhand responses to I scored better than I've ever scored on that, or I scored worse, or I scored about the same. And you always see those anyway, so the anecdotal noise after this test and the scores come out is going to be confusing, and it probably will be indiscernible in, in terms of like a final conclusion. Yeah. I do know this, though. Just because there are inherent benefits in the way they are administering this and shortening it and so forth, it doesn't mean that you're going to come out and be like, oh, it's just better off for me. There are things they can do inside the test that actually account for those types of results. And this may be a situation where uh, the people in the psychometrics department end up doing more work after the exam to make sure that it really does adhere to the kind of normalization curves that they want to see from these exams. No test is perfect, but I have said many times before, I have the deepest level of respect for the people who make this test, the actual physical process of putting it together, the people who make the questions. Uh, if there's a place to have trust here, I actually do have trust that they can kind of make this transition. Mm -hmm. So, and they have said quite bluntly, it will be similar. We're using the same questions. We know how to handle this. And I, I want to point that out and then we'll get into the, you know, the scaling. Yeah. Uh, score conversion and how that affects everything, because I think that's the, still the biggest question. This isn't the first time that they've ever given three-section LSATs, where it's just one of each of these sections. From 1989 to 1991, the LSAT scored sections were one logical reasoning, one logic games, and one reading comprehension. So it's not as if this is some kind of new fantastic world to them. The perceived problem, and I, and I shouldn't say perceived, the real problem here is, is that Everybody else in the last 20 years has been taking an LSAT. That is two LR. 30 years, yeah. Yeah. Boy, it's been a long time. I know, right? I, know. I just did that math. I was like, oh boy, we're old. It's been forever <laughs> and a day. Uh, they, and that's the expectation. You prepare, you study thinking it's two LR. It's 50% of the test. And so that becomes a really big, big question here. But if they took the scaling on this exam and made it a lot tighter, they could offset some perceived easiness. It's really hard to say. And this is where we get into elements that they're showing a great degree of hesitancy to talk about yet. 
So when you look at this, this isn't their first rodeo with this. They have data on how this works. They have produced LSAT scores that people used to go to law school years and years ago that came out of this exact format. Does that make it the same as today? No. Students are way better informed today about the LSAT than they were yeah. years and years ago. And that was still an in-person paper test, too. So even that's different. also true. Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is the Wild West. That's why you know we call this podcast the end of the world, and it's because they're they're they've reached the end of the world as they know it in some respects, and now they're about to jump off. And it's you the either get an air world, current, I think, <laughs> you either get an air current and rise, or you plunge to your death. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, I I think yeah I think this is probably going to be a, a flying kite as opposed to a sinking ship, but it's interesting to be sure. Um, it's hard to say, though, how things are going to play out. I will say this, and you and I both are on the exact same page with this. I, I take them at their word when it comes to this because I know they're very good at what they do when it comes to designing the test itself, maintaining whatever you want to call it, equity. Yeah, I've said this before. Among standardized tests, I think they're the best. Yes. And that is, that's long been their strength. Uh, I've seen nothing that suggests that that strength is going away. So if there is a part of them to rely on, to get this right, it's the, the people who are actually making the exam on the psychometric level. Yeah, perfect. Well, let's get a little uncomfortable. <laughs> let's talk about the one thing, the biggest looming question that I think neither of us has a perfect answer for yet. How are they going to make this scale on a different number of raw questions, especially with an entire section lost, as it were? Yeah, that is, this is the question of the day. And I think uh, I'd said to somebody earlier, this will continue to be debated until they give us a final answer. And I really hope they give us a final answer. It would be unfair not to. Yeah, hopefully so, at that webinar next week, frankly. Yeah, they better get it before then or on that date. Now, let's take a look at how this works, because I think this is, can be a point that's lost a little bit. We know the standard score on this test is going to be 120 to 180. But we're looking at roughly 75 questions as opposed to the usual 100, 101 questions. Mm -hmm. And you are used to a test where there's two logical reasonings and one of the other two. So LR, when you're studying and preparing for it, you know that's half the test. If you're good at logical reasoning on the regular LSAT, it's 50% of the way. That's really going to carry you uh, to a pretty good score just on its own. Yeah. Now what happens? Now we're three sections and there are choices in terms of what they will do. So let's go through the choices okay. that they have. Uh, and again, we don't know what they're going to do. And I hate that, man. I like to be able to say, this is what to do. This is the answer. So uncertainty kind of kills me. Yeah, that's why I said let's get uncomfortable because I know both of us kind of like recoil from this. Yeah, well, as we saw all the questions in their, in their webinar, this is the question. Yeah. Um, so, so when you say that there are options, choices that they could make, options for how they could potentially um, engineer this, to me, I see two. All right. One is they could simply do a percentile conversion based off of raw score out of, say, 75 questions. We know they grade this thing on a bell curve. We know, as I explained to someone on Reddit, let's say 173 is the top 1%. If that's normally, say, 90 questions out of 101 they could make it 68 questions out of 75 and essentially adjust the scale up or down. And again, I'm, okay. I'm completely randomizing or spitballing numbers here, but they could do that. What's your percentage chance? Oh, now make you uncomfortable. What's your percentage <laughs> chance that that's the solution? You're such a jerk. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to give my own assessment. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think they would do that. To me, that would fundamentally change the nature of what they have always prioritized on the test itself, which has clearly been logical reasoning. And we'll talk yeah. about that as the second option in just a second. So I don't think they're going to make it a, a straight raw conversion. I don't think so either. Okay. The history of the test doesn't suggest that that would be their approach to this. So The fact me, that they've actually moved away from that model in 89 to 91 to a different one and maintained that for almost 30 years tells me I think they have to value things in a way that will carry through, despite the fact that we've lost a section. There's also a question of how much, how dissimilar do you want it to be? Right. I mean, how many changes do you want to make to this test? You just flex down to three <laughs> sections. Uh, and that is a huge change. The more changes you make, the harder it is to get things 
to produce similar uh, results. Yeah. Let's go to the the solution that I so, yeah I was going to say what that think suggests, will be most likely what that suggests to me is the second option, which is they simply double your logical reasoning result. This is not the one I think is the most likely outcome. Interesting. By the way. This is what I figured they might do here is you take your logical reasoning score and say well we've always counted it twice despite there being twice as many questions we'll double it what do you think would happen first off i don't like the solution just posed because that puts double weight on every single question that's a huge amount of pressure and unfairness i know but it at least mirrors the current system where logical reasoning is half your score Okay. What do you I think? Have two more, I have two more solutions two more. here. My goodness. Let's really muddy these waters. Go. <laughs> the one that I feel is probably the most likely mm-hmm. is the same thing they did in the late 80s, early 90s. And that is this. Every question has equal value. They take the raw score from each of the three sections, add it together, then convert it over to a 120 to 180 scale. That is shorter because it's only got 75 questions or so than the one we currently have, but basically looks the same where the first 10 or 15 questions that you get right, you're still at 120. And then you start moving up. Dangerous? Oh yeah, totally. That was the first option I presented here where everything's just compressed. you did a percentage. Well, it's based off of the percentile, but they try to curve things the same. Okay. I didn't understand what you were saying. I thought you you were saying it's an exact percentage. And so you then take the percentage across the entire 75 and assign it. Got to it. Well, like questions. if a 152 converted score splits people in half, let's say, well, how did half the people do in terms of a raw number? That was the okay. first thing I was talking about. That's what I mean by I grading I saw that people. as a uniform application to everything, whereas that's not how I think it'll be. I think it'll be much like what we currently see, where everything is weighted equally. All right. So that's the first thing. The second thing they could do or third or fourth, really. This is fourth overall. <laughs> John's percentage idea is the same the as, double, what you just, as what you just said. It's percentage. not, actually. We said it slightly differently. Trust me on this. Okay, it is not. Fair enough. Go ahead. Uh, your percentage, which is applied equally across the scale, a uh, doubling of LR, the idea that I just talked about, which is virtually identical to the current scenario. Again, your point noted. And then the last one is this. What if they decided to go to a percentage and they weighted it differently? So that, for example, the one LR section is 40% of your raw score, and then the LG and the RC are, who knows, 30% each. That's another option. So like a I don't scalar, think like a multiplier. Likely. I don't think that's likely either, so at least we agree on something. Yeah. I think the two most likely choices are double the logical reasoning, and then the most likely choice out of, uh, out of the final two is that they actually make it all equal. So that each section is, you know, roughly 33% of your final scaled score. Yeah. For what it's worth, that was what I was referring to with my first point. When I said scaled on a percentile, I just mean they would do the same bell curve distribution that they do now. I talked in percents, you talked in weight, but it's the same thing. That's what I meant. I know what you meant. I also don't think that's what they're going to do for what it's worth. That's fair. we actually come down on different sides of this issue a little bit. I, I know what you meant. The interesting thing was, as you were talking, I was like, boy, I hadn't thought about this. Hmm. Straight percentile without the kind of score conversion scale, because you're really jumping over it. So, point taken that you meant the other one. Okay. <laughs> I could show you no, later how this actually funny, works. Somewhere in there, it was, there, was a, there was an insult of inarticulation. <laughs> Okay, yes, there was. was. (laughs) (laughs) If you want to sit down afterwards and be like, let me show you the difference in how these two scalings would work, we can. On the other hand, it was a compliment because I hadn't thought about that option. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is, I thought, very left field, but something I hadn't considered. I think they're going to double LR. That's my bet. Well, again, we should know in a week, so we can actually make a proper wager here. I think that they're going to hold to what they did in the past and say that it doesn't really matter. You're testing a lot of the same ideas. I totally disagree with that, but I think this is what they may say. And so, therefore, every question has equal weight. Let's focus on your side of this wager because I'm curious then as to what that would mean for test takers because it really does change the fundamental dynamic of skill sets, right? The consequences of that make this a very different test than it has been in the past for people. 
And of course, that's my big worry. Of course, yeah. In the same way that you're overvaluing each of the LR questions by doubling right. it. Jeez, that's scary to me. Scary to me uh, too. <laughs> mine is scary because you just changed the dimensions of the test mm -hmm. and the emphases that people have had in terms of studying. And of course, we know this is the case. When I look at somebody who's taking the test and they're struggling with logical reasoning, I'm like, it's half the test. Put some time into that. You right. get a huge payback from that. So to take that away, what it really does fundamentally is it advantages some test takers and it would disadvantage other test takers. Yeah. If you're really good at games or reading comprehension in particular, man, what a day. Best test ever. Yeah. But if, just games, game yeah, if games are your big concern, if games are clearly where you're going to struggle or reading comp even worse because there's more of them, that's just become at least a third of your test as opposed to 25% in the past, roughly. Just got more important. And if you are yeah. great at LR, you don't want my solution or no. what I think they're – it's not my solution, what we'll I think see. they're likely to do. You want John's solution, which is double it up. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing is just off the top of our heads, we've come up with four different ways to parse out a scale for this test. And again, Occam's razor says to me the simplest solution, which is to keep a, a, a kind of like everything equal, is likely to be what they will do. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, when I look at this, I know that logical reasoning sections often differ in overall difficulty, and they are designed to kind of offset each other and come to kind of like a middle ground. So to construct a test like this, if they were to double LR, they would have to really strive to have an LR section that was right down the middle. They'd have very little margin for error. It couldn't be a little bit extra difficult or a little bit extra easy because that would skew scores very quickly. Yeah, we've talked in some of our crystal balls about question variance. Imagine they had an LR section that had nine must-be-trues or two must-be-trues. You couldn't really do that. It wouldn't be fair. It would require you to test almost everything in the general allotment that you see yeah. across the, the across history. Some sort of like median amount. Um, yeah, so this whole thing is it's just wonky. But I don't know. Yeah. I'm hoping they, they give us information on this next week. Well, we need to have it because first off, you can see depending upon which direction you go with the scoring, some people get an advantage, some people don't. It also changes how you would study. Exactly. If you've been studying thinking that LR is 50% of the deal and all of a sudden it's going to drop down to roughly 33%, you need to actually go spend a lot more time on these other topics. Yeah, yeah. Then reading comp just takes on a new importance. Logic games take on a new importance. So, yeah, that would be uh, – and if LR is going to be half your test but each question counts double, essentially, then suddenly exactly that becomes right. the, the shift in priority. Yeah. So I think this type of information that we're talking about is critically important to making decisions for students who are about to study and to prepare. Yes. Yeah, well, that we are in agreement about. So, again, hopefully in the webinar next week that they release, we'll, uh, we'll have these answers. As soon as we do, I can say we will, uh, we will update people as we learn them, as we always do. Yes. So, again, that's part of the fairness process here. We need information to really make a true judgment on the validity and the viability of the uh, the three scale test. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that you know kept coming up, even in the seminar today, was like how law schools would view this, whether or not the results will be credible, mm -hmm. whether or not cheating is possible. <laughs> and so let's talk a little bit about those issues. Yeah, I feel like we we covered the prior one reasonably well. Sure. Um where do you want to start with sure. that? Because it's <laughs> <laughs> sure. Where do you want to start? Because obviously there's a wide range of call it credibility concerns with this. Well, why don't we go ahead and start with um, some of the things that would undermine the results here? Okay. Well, let's start with cheating. This was the first thing I saw get loudly repeated yesterday uh, online which is great. So basically they've just opened the door for people to come up with some sort of like technological backdoor, essentially. You can cheat. I don't think so. No, I don't either. Especially on Twitter, a lot of people who just saw the announcement that I'd made but didn't know a whole lot about like at-home testing these days were like, this is unreasonable. You could have somebody sit next to you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, 
You can't. Yeah. It doesn't work that you way. You can just run a wire from your computer and do a screen share where someone, I'm like, they're going to have ways to detect this stuff. Oh, yeah. Somebody was like, you could do open book. I'm like, on the LSAT? Really? You think that's going to help? Yeah. First that's of all, that's slow a terrible you down. Your score's going down. That's the worst thing you could do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you could have someone in the room feeding you answers. I was like, eh, that's really not going to happen. Those are not the technical issues. When when we talk about cheating on this test and LSAC security concerns, yeah, they're they're worried about people actually getting an advantage during the test, mm -hmm. although they know that that's a little bit less likely. What they're really concerned about is somehow someone screen captures or is able to save the contents of the test. That's what they really don't want to have happen, and you can figure out why pretty quickly. Yeah. So, I don't think it's a live advantage they're worried about. I think it's an after the fact, whether it's copyright or sharing or something that they're concerned with. Yeah. I mean, that brings up all sorts of questions because someone was saying, will they allow me to use earplugs? I live on a really noisy street. And my fear here is that, although I completely understand where you're coming from, they're going to think that ear, you know, pods, earbuds, what have you, are a security risk. Hmm. And consequently, they're probably going to say that anything that looks like that, just like on a regular LSAT, yeah, exactly. is going to be banned. They don't let you use them in the room. They're definitely not going to let you use them in your room. Yeah. So when we look at things like credibility from cheating and the way you approach the test, some of the advantages that people thought that they were going to getting or could attempt to take advantage of or exploit maybe is the better term, yeah. they're not going to actually be there. And so the real question then becomes from a credibility standpoint – how are law schools going to look at these scores? Yeah, what do the results look like in terms of how they'll be treated? Uh, and there was a lot of conversation today in that webinar about this. There was in the one last week, I think it was last week, uh, that you and I both attended as well. And it's been fairly universal. Law schools are excited for this. They're going to get results sooner than they thought they would get them. These are people that weren't going to be able to submit scores for this year that can now. Law schools are, are pumped um, from what I've been able to gather. And they also um, are treating this, from what I can tell, as a valid LSAT score. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember what's happening here. LSAC has cooked this up, all right? They flexed their might and uh, created LSAT flex. And what they've done is they've gone out and they've said to law schools, this is what our plan is. This will give you these benefits, more candidates, uh, more higher scores. How do you guys feel about that? And I'm sure the schools were like, this sounds great. Is it going to be the same type of results? And LSAC has, uh, from my conversation with them yesterday, from what mm -hmm. they said today, they've already started to beat the drum of this is the same LSAT that students would see anyway, and the results produced will be the same. And they can point to 70 years of format changes saying we were been able to produce good candidates. We've we've been the standard for for scores. This is just another format change, but we know how to deal with it. Yeah. And Mimi Wang, who is the uh, works in admissions, she might be the dean of admissions at Lewis and Clark, was on that webinar today, and I wrote down what she said about this. She said LSAC would not have made this option available if it wasn't valid. Mm -hmm. So already the belief system is in place that they know what they're doing. We trust them. Yeah. And that's because they've always trusted them and have for years. At, at one point, I think it was her that also said, we're very excited about this, yeah. that they have been able to make this happen. Now, the one thing that gave me pause, just like when they didn't have the dates of the test gave me pause, was that there is going to be a note placed on your record that says that you took the at-home test option. And that bothers me, because usually when you try to flag things, you're trying to say they're different. And we know in accommodations past they did that, and that's been stopped. Yes. And so we look at this, I'm like, if it's producing identical results and is just as predictive and just as valid as the so-called regular LSAT, why are we doing this? Yeah, I think the, the note from LSAC specifically is we will highlight candidates or highlight scores that were taken under these conditions. At the same time, they assign a test date to every score. So it's not like schools couldn't have looked at this and been like, May 2020. Oh, they would have known, right? Yeah. It seems strange that you'd even have the asterisk, but... It, it almost appeared to me that LSAC was thinking, no, 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 we're highlighting it because it's actually a positive. Interesting. You had to take this test under extraordinary circumstances, and that's something that should be noted. 
which is very different than how the typical law school applicant looks at it. Like, my score got flagged? I'm different. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm yeah, screwed. they're going to judge me worse. Yeah, now they're going to think I took an easier test. So we got a number of questions about how will law schools look at this. The early indications are that, and LSAC also said, we've talked to many, many law schools and gotten overwhelming positive response. I don't know, you know, to what extent overwhelmingly positive is. I don't know what objections were raised. Right. But I will say this, if they go out and they sell this as being valid, the typical law school admissions office will buy into it. It'll still be a 120 to 180 score that gets reported to the ABA. And the ABA isn't going to be like, oh, yeah, those people took the May test. They're just going to throw it into the big data grinder and <laughs> push it out. And that is perfectly in accordance with literally Every single thing I've heard from any admissions dean at this point, every one of them has said, we're going to treat this the same way we would treat any other score. Yeah. So for those of you worried about like, is this going to make my application look bad? No. No. If it gets you in the pool or it allows you to raise your score a little bit more to negotiate some financials, that's going to be a positive. Yeah. So at least as far as how schools look at that score, it appears that already they're going to treat it as just another LSAT score. Yeah. The, like that's fair or not? Right. Totally other issue. The only possible exception I could see raised to this would be if the ABA demanded a different type of reporting. If schools they're weren't... Gonna. Yeah, I don't think so. I can't imagine. God, I'd just be cruel. But if schools weren't allowed to report your 168 the same way a normal 168 would be reported, but I cannot imagine that's the case. And certainly we've got no evidence that it would be at this point. No. I agree. That, that is the one thing. The ABA runs the show at the end of the day in terms of like what you can accept or not accept, how you treat scores. Yeah. But the ABA and LSAC um, certainly work together. They're sympathetic to each other. And if LSAC is telling the ABA and law schools that these scores are valid and just the same as so-called regular LSAT scores, <laughs> they're going to buy it. Yep. So. So, yeah, good news for me. Yeah. Now, there are some other groups out there that I think have, are going to be affected by this process, one of which is international test takers. I got a lot of questions from international test takers like, does this include us? It does not seem to. No. I don't find that fair. I would like to see the international test takers who lost the March test, just like all the domestic test takers. I'd love to see them included, but they haven't addressed that. And the language on their website basically says, if you were registered for the April 2020 LSAT. Okay, now the international test takers, they didn't have an April test. So they're not actually included in this kind of like conditional right here. Mm -hmm. um, and they weren't moved from March to April because that's not what happened with the international test. So as stated currently, they don't seem to be included. Is it possible that they could be included kind of like as a, you know, go back and allow them in? It is, but it sure seems like they, and they said this to me, they're like, we're focusing on the April people who just got canceled and getting them into the room or their room, <laughs> the test room, <laughs> their test room. So I have a bad feeling that international test takers are out until June. Yeah. There's a have secondary part of this too, which is that international test takers haven't been taking a digital test yet. Yeah. And so to be totally suddenly them. shift them onto a, yeah, an online interface would be Great a point. complete, um, I mean, reversal of what they've been doing. They're still on paper. Yeah. Now, could they try to add something for international test takers? Sure. But there's been no indication yet that they're going to do that. So everything right now points to international test takers are out of luck. I hope that changes because yeah. I don't think it's fair. Yeah. Their next option is June 27th, 28th. So they've got quite a while to wait. Yeah, the other question that I saw come up in the webinar a lot, and I certainly was asked about it last night, was accommodated test takers. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that I would say about accommodated test takers is that the digital LSAT format was designed to handle a wide variety of accommodations. So in many instances, just like the software that they've been pushing out, it will take care of a number of accommodations that people uh, have been granted, such as extra time for example. Larger or, text, yeah. Yeah, larger text, changing the color of the text and so forth. So they didn't specifically mention accommodated test takers, but that's because by and large, and I, this is not everybody, but a good portion of accommodated test takers are actually 
uh, able to take the test in the digital format with no real change. They just choose their time. They put input, uh, you know, the parameters for them, and off they go. Yeah. There was one group though that is basically in the dark right now, and it doesn't matter whether you know if you're one of those people. I, you don't care about the rest of this. This is frustrating. Yeah. And these are the people who have been granted an accommodation to take a paper-based LSAT. So I know that LSAC is, is these days much more focused on accommodations. They haven't mentioned what they're doing with this. So that is something to track here. And I know there was some frustration over the fact that they didn't, but that was also part of the, the rush to get this information into the public. Right. So it was definitely imperfect on that. And I saw that question come up in the webinar a bunch. I got it a bunch last night. And this is part of the, you know, this is a problem for them. They need to address this quickly as well. So let's talk about some of the issues going forward. Yeah, you mentioned getting some of these questions last night. You and I have both been getting absolutely hammered by just uh, an endless barrage of curiosities, let's call them. Let's run through some of the common questions that we've gotten and uh, just get our answers best we have them on record. Um, for instance, this is obviously happening in May. Do you think it's going to happen again in June? There's a June 8th test date here in North America currently. There's one in July. What do you think happens for the flex through the summer? <laughs> Which is, normally means whole different things. <laughs> <laughs> nice flex, bro. Summer bond. <laughs> uh, well, as far as the flex, it looks to me that if they cannot have in-person testing, they'll flex it again. So th this gives them now the ability to bypass the need for a college or a conference facility or a hotel, or what have you. So if June in is not something that can be done in person, they'll flex it. Yeah. I think that was very clear. Susan Krinsky uh, was on that webinar and she's been with LSAC a long time and she was like, this gives us options. And that's where they started talking about the crisis actually having some silver linings because they're like, they were forced to do this and now they feel as if they can do it and this gives them a backup option. They did say this though, that if they can have in-person tests, it looks like they'll go back to the regular format. Sure. So this isn't a permanent replacement. I don't, I, there's not a world that I imagine where they give both options. I do think that what we may be seeing though is a preview of the, the distant future. That we could see at-home tests in a couple of years. We could have a shorter LSAT uh, with that. So you may be getting a kind of like forced preview of what a new LSAT looks like down the road. Yeah, I've been thinking the same thing. Uh, I don't think June is going to happen in person. So I think June is probably going to be another flex. Uh, hopefully by July they can um, they can flex in person. Yeah, we we totally agree on that. Yeah. Although in July it wouldn't be a flex in person. Just to yeah, it would I just know that be, was a joke. Yeah, that's just a joke. <laughs> it would be the regular five section yeah. LSAT. That's when you get to flex in person. Flex out, Ow. summertime. So going down the road, I know a lot of people are going to take this May and this June test, but not apply this cycle. How do you think this is going to transition into people applying into 2021's fall cycle, who are going to be back, perhaps competing against the more normal? Uh, administrative types. Yeah. Do, and we we'll, talked a little bit about this already. How are schools going to look at this longer term? Let's say you, you use this test three years down the line. Are schools going to look at it somehow negatively or judge you? Uh, I don't think they will. I don't either. I think they're going to be like, it's another LSAT score. Thank you. Let me have your application fee and continue on. <laughs> yeah. You either help our numbers or don't. We'll take it. Or won't. Yeah. So yeah, unless the reporting of this is somehow flagged by ABA is different, this is going to be just another test. Yeah. If they're convinced that you can get into the school and do well, and your LSAT flex score looks in line with their numbers, they actually have an incentive to take you. Because they're like, why would we want to treat you differently when LSAC is saying your score is the same? Yeah. We get to report it. Great. Yeah. Which, for anyone who can take the test then in May... But maybe he's a little worried about like this stigma or something. There is no stigma. Take it in May. This is one of the greatest opportunities I've seen since last July to you know get a one up on the system a little bit. This is a yeah. huge benefit. And so go ahead and take advantage of it. Exactly. Of course, this presents a problem because how do you prepare for a three section test? 
That's a very good Especially question. when you don't know how the logical reasoning is weighted compared to all the other questions. Yeah. Because that My, completely changes the calculus, frankly, as we talked about. Uh, certainly of how you spend your time. And this is why I immediately went on Twitter during the middle of the seminar and was like, I'm pretty disappointed yeah. they're not addressing this central question. I that saw that tweet. A thousand people are asking. Uh, and again, you know, they'll address it in a week, but that's a week of lost studying. Mm -hmm. And I, I oftentimes feel in these conversations, as I watched that webinar, I thought again, they're trying to get applicants for law school because they really are focused on law schools. And a lot of the language they were getting out was, hey, you could still apply to law school. Everything's reasonable. And I'm always thinking to myself, who's going to take up the mantle for students? You know, who's going to actually like talk about this? Mm -hmm. And it, it's hard. Sometimes it feels like you're just shouting in the wilderness because they have the answers and I can only ask so many times. Uh, I'm sure some of the people at LSAC are like, dude, stop it. Because I sent them a ton of emails. I know you did. I know you sent like at least <laughs> five emails hours. in the last, yeah, in the last been, day. It's been a stream. And I'm actually, as we're doing this podcast, I check my phone every once in a while. I'm like, did I get an answer? Because I'd really like to do uh, it. Yeah, it'd be nice to have a, yeah, a live update here. John, you know that it'll come in two minutes after we're Of course, done. as soon as we stop recording. <laughs> but how do you prepare for a three-section test when there's only one of each section? Yeah, yeah. Do you stop taking four-section tests, for instance? And that's probably the easiest question of all to answer. No. Keep taking those four-section tests. Adding experimentals for a fifth section, if you're looking at May, that's probably become less necessary. But keep your stamina up. Take four. Yeah. Now, if it turns out that um, each section is weighted equally, then those four section tests, you could rotate in a, a different section each time mm -hmm. to kind of keep it fresh. But I always prefer to have high stamina. One of the big advantages of this test for the people who are taking it is that stamina and fatigue, there, aren't, there are fewer problems with this. Hence the, you know, the wide criticism of this exam by the people who can't take it of being like, this is easier, it's unfair. I totally acknowledge that. I think that it is a difference. The question is, is how do they offset that? And since I don't know the answer to that, I can't say exactly how unfair it is. Certainly the physicality of this, I think, is, is arguably the greatest benefit. You could have a cup of totally. coffee and a snack five minutes before your test starts. That's huge. It's wildly beneficial. Yeah. The, the thing is, is just because an event is shorter and less physically taxing doesn't mean that your results are any better. Yeah. And that's where we really, you know, I've wanted to come back to this fairness issue because we were in the middle of it. And um, we we're talking about a lot of different issues. That fairness issue to me is really important. And the people who are like, this is totally unfair. It's a different test. I hear you, man. Yeah. I completely understand what you are saying with this because it is a different test. It has similarities, but it's like going out with a girl and then discovering that every once in a while her twin sister comes on the date instead. You're like, it's pretty similar. Interesting analogy. <laughs> it's not identical. Uh -huh. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something like, sometimes she doesn't make you stay through dessert. You just get to go home. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> She's the identical sister <laughs> cuts down the date. She leaves right after, right. Uh, you know, she eats the first couple of bites of her own. Right? <laughs> uh, that's I don't know a ridiculous how well that analogy. Metaphor but, holds up. Yeah, but, but the point is, yeah, I mean, you want to keep your stamina up, but this is going to require a different type of stamina than a five-section test typically would. Yeah. Which is, I mean, again, there's a benefit. You don't get a break in the middle, eh, but the break would have occurred after this test is over anyway. Uh, exactly. You're, I, you're I got first a couple three of, sections. Yeah, I got a couple of messages um, last night from people, though, that forced me to rethink this at least a little bit, which was... It's also harder to like get into a rhythm. A lot of people perform better on the second LR section, for instance, mm -hmm. because they've they've got like kind of a, a momentum to it, or they're in the groove. That's not going to happen here. So, at the same time, there could be downsides to this for some people. How do you practice? I mean, you try to replicate the real thing, but again, I'd, I'd go bigger. I'd go more. I would too. I would say to those people who are slow starters, do some questions beforehand. We've talked about that multiple times in earlier podcast episodes. There's a, a great uh, uh, blog that we wrote called Should You Do LSAT Questions the Morning of the Test mm -hmm. or something similar to that. There are ways to get around that. Yeah. I do think from a waiting standpoint, uh, how you wait the amount of time you spend on each of these sections, okay. that until we have a real answer, I would wait them equally. That way you are at least covered on all fronts. 
Um, and then if things change, then obviously pay attention to that. And if need be, change how you're actually studying. But yeah. th this is tough because going down to 75 questions, to me, magnifies the importance of each question. Everything gets a little bit more important. And that concerns me. And now if they go ahead and they double at LR, then LR becomes even more important. Sure. Any misses there, double penalize you. So we need more information to really know exactly how this works and what kind of effects it has on just not just scores and performance, but also on how you actually study for this. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree with you on that point, despite the fact that you and I maybe have landed on slightly different sides of what we think they'll do. Right now, treat everything equally. Yeah. It's the most logical approach for what is hopefully a short period of time. And as this goes forward, anytime I get an update from them or see something that uh, is indicative of what's going to happen, I'll be posting it on my Twitter and you certainly will post it on yours. Sure. I'm sure you'll post it on Reddit and so forth. So the last question that we had was, how do you think this affects the current cycle in terms of admissions. Yeah, specifically wait lists or well, I'm sure scholarships factor in as well. I mean, yeah. it's, it's certainly great news in a way. It gives schools data that they can use to make decisions that otherwise they wouldn't have had. That's good. It's great news depending on who you are. Yeah. And, and again, this goes back to the fairness issue. And it's this is really one of the things I wanted to talk about quite a bit is that depending on who you are, you either get a big advantage or you're irritated. Yeah. If you're on a wait list right now and can't take May, you've got more competition coming potentially. That's irritating yeah. to say the also, least. Also, if you're on that wait list, you know that there's going to be movement that's coming up because there are deposit deadlines uh, in May. There's also the double deposit uh, information that goes out to law schools about how many candidates have uh, deposits at more than one school. Mm -hmm. But insofar as this, a bunch of schools just said, well, we're going to get May results. Yay. It could save our cycle. So we're going to wait. So if you are a person who can't take this test and you're on that wait list, this probably slows the movement of the wait list that you, you're going to still see some because of the deadlines coming up and, and things like that. That'll reveal some things to law schools and they'll, they'll take some candidates there. So it'll be a wave. But it may push back what has already been a really slow cycle yeah. even further, which is truly frustrating. And that's another reason the people who don't have the option of taking this test are just pissed. <laughs> to put it mildly. What are else at? This causes me issues and it's going to increase competition. There is nothing in this for them that's a happy moment. Mm -mm. For law schools, there's plenty to be happy about. For the test takers who are taking the exam, shorter exam, it's awesome. Hopefully, it's scored like a normal LSAT and there's a way that you can figure out how to study beforehand and that they, it's not some brutal scale they put on this Yeah, because that's where they could really hurt people. If they put a tight scale on this, someone would be like, well, I did fewer questions and I felt better, but man, I still got hit. Yeah. So, for those of you taking this test, there's good, there's some concerns and that's probably the best overview I can give of all the, the different stakeholders in this debate. Yeah. I was just thinking to myself, can I sum it up better? No. You cannot. <laughs> no, I cannot. <laughs> that's unimprovably good. Nice. Any, uh, any final thoughts you think then? You know, I suppose the only final thought I really have in this is that it's still oh, – there's some unanswered questions here clearly. So we're going to have to circle back to this and provide updates as we go, and we will. For anyone listening who's like, is that the best you got? As of now. But more is coming. Yeah. And hopefully it's something that comes out that's, you know, as fair as possible for the greatest number of people. For sure. Hopefully we get more information about international test takers, about the paper-based accommodated test takers, about the LR situation, uh, as much as information yeah. as we can about the scoring scale. School conversion. deadline extensions, which are coming, et cetera. Yeah, and for those of you frustrated by this, I understand. I feel you. Uh, th these are also weird and wacky times, <laughs> uh, scary times in, in so many respects. And unfortunately, it forces all of us into a position of having to deal with this uncertainty. Uh, you know, Kelly Testy kept saying and has said in almost every conversation I've had with her, we have to be nimble right now. And I heard some of the admissions uh, deans say the same thing where they're like, we're trying to be nimble. We're trying to stay on top of it. That's because there's so many moving parts. Yeah. So it's not just you, the applicant, 
who's having difficulty with this. The law schools are having difficulty with it. LSAC is having difficulty with it. John, you and I are like, right. man, sometimes it's like being in the middle of a maelstrom. That's exactly right. Yeah, this hurricane is just slippery, day to day even. Yeah, I started this episode by saying, did you think in episode 50 <laughs> that we would be talking about a three-section LSAT? But, dude, I could say that almost, about almost every topic we've had this year. This has yeah. been the most... Uh, contentious, uncertain, strange year in LSAT history that I can recall. Yeah, I figured one of us would be recording this from Betty Ford by now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure some people have worries when they yeah. listen to how much At the rate drink. this is going, that's still a very high pop like, probability. <laughs> that's why I'm drinking coffee right now. Yeah, well. All right. I think that about sums it up. There'll be more to come on this. This is certainly not the final word on it. LSAC has a lot more to tell us, and we will be there to try to help out, answer questions, keep people posted on what's going on. If you do get a chance, come join us tomorrow night, uh, Thursday night, uh, for our reading comprehension webinar. It is free. You can enroll online on our website. We'd love to see you there. And we're looking forward to talking about some of the cool things that we do with RC. Uh, however, on that note, <laughs> if you do get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it. Give us a rating. And if you have questions, definitely send them to us at lsatpodcast at powerscore.com. We have been trying to answer as many questions recently as we can. We've got another episode coming up relatively soon. We're going to answer a bunch of admissions questions. So on that note, and on behalf of John and myself, thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate it. Have a great week and stay safe.